So, ready? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, my name is Moses Okech. Could I have your attention again? Uh, my name is Moses Okech. I'm a professor here and I co-direct the Center for Education and International Development, which we call in, so in short SEED. And uh, I also, you know, chair the SEED seminar series and I work with my colleague William uh, to make this seminar series happen. This is our sixth, actually, seminar series for this year. They've been very interesting for those of of you have come before, I mean, very insightful uh, ideas have been exchanged. If you are, if you are new, you can sign up uh, and, and continue. Uh, today, uh, I'm actually also a panelist, so I'm going to be presenting, not just chairing uh, the session. And we are going to be uh, looking at the topic of uh, building effective and inclusive education systems, insights from Ethiopia and, and Vietnam. And the presenters are Rachel Kane and myself. And uh, to start off, all, as off is going to be Rachel, and then uh, we are going to have Kane, and then finally myself. Maybe Rachel will say something a little bit about herself as a matter of introduction, and all the other colleagues, if you are students here, maybe you already know them, but if you are from um, elsewhere, they'll say a little bit who they are and uh, before they make their presentation. So welcome. Rachel, please. Okay, so hi everybody, uh, thank you for coming. I'm sorry I'm a little delayed. Um, so I'm Rachel Fitzpatrick, I work at Education Development Trust, um, and I'm going to be starting off today's session um, telling you about research we did, <coughs> system level reform research at Vietnam. Um, and I'll, I'm, a, so I'm a research officer at Education Development Trust, um, and I worked on this project for two years uh, alongside colleagues in Vietnam at the Vietnam Institute of Educational Sciences. So first of all, um, why would we look into Vietnam? So this chart here uh, kind of says it all really. So at the bottom, the horizontal axis, you'll see this is a measure of GDP per capita. So it's a wealth indicator. And on the vertical axis here, we can see um, minimum levels achieved in PISA in science results. So this indicator on the, the vertical axis basically says that um, the number of students who achieve the expected level for 15 year olds in science in the PISA international test. And what we can see is that the poorest country, Vietnam, achieved the highest level of basic proficiency in science. Um, so obviously that gave us kind of that made the world kind of look at Vietnam and think, what are they doing to be one of the poorest participating countries uh, to manage to do so well on one of these uh, performance of quality indicators? Um, so there are other indicators as well, and you'll hear later about Young Lives, but the Young Lives study also found that children in primary education um, were also achieving high standards for their age. So as you can see, that 85% can subtract fractions, um, subtract in fractions and 81% are able to find x in a simple equation. So for the primary school level children of that age it was considered truly exceptional. So why we've called it promising practice so why promising and why not amazing or something like that? Well they still have a little way to go in Vietnam so enrollment rate at upper secondary level is still not universal. Um, there are still some performance gaps between disadvantaged groups and their more advantaged peers. So we're seeing this as more of a promising picture rather than suggesting Vietnam are exactly where they want to be. And that's how our colleagues in Vietnam see it as well. Another important factor before I get into our findings is to say that we did look at the education system, but there are also factors outside of the education system that might have a really big influence on how well students perform. Um, and one of these is culture. So whenever we ask participants, what do you think one of the main reasons that students did well in PISA is, a lot of them would say our learning culture. Um, and we do think that attributes it to some extent, but you can't just have culture alone in order to produce a good education system. Um, and also, we've put in brackets here, private tutoring. We know that lots of students in Vietnam um, 
do take part in private tutoring, but we don't know to the extent and what impact that actually has on their learning outcomes in school. So that's why it's kind of in brackets, we're not quite sure. Okay, so I'll quickly go through our methods before I get to our key findings. So we talked to a variety of stakeholders in four provinces in Vietnam. Uh, we selected these provinces because uh, they vary in terms of population size, um, other kinds of demographics as well. Uh, so Ha Zang at the top there, very mountainous, very rural. Um, you know, if you look at pictures online of Ha Zhang, you probably think, oh, it looks great for kind of a tourist attraction, and it is. Um, it's really beautiful. But if you can imagine building schools in that kind of location and also getting to school there, it's very tricky. And the majority of the population are from ethnic minority groups. Um, and in Vietnam, only 8% of the entire population are indigenous ethnic minority groups. But in Ha Zhang and other surrounding provinces, the majority of the population are from these groups. And these groups don't speak Vietnamese as a first language, so they have some extra barriers when they go to school. Uh, Binh Dinh is another one of the locations we uh, conducted field work in. Every year they get kind of attacked by monsoons. Uh, so this is some images of them hair drying textbooks after the schools are flooded. Um, and this happens every single year and they try and do, you know, flood protection, that kind of thing. But the weather's so bad, that they, you know, they can't really avoid it. Um, so again, kind of a different barrier to what you'd see in uh, Hazang. And then here we have Ho Chi Minh City, but it could also be Hanoi. Uh, if any of you have been there, it's a bit of a shock to the senses. Uh, really densely populated. Um, a lot of the wealth in Vietnam are in these two cities. So again, and the majority of the populations are the ethnic majority group. So they don't all face the same barriers, but there might be some urban disadvantage that you wouldn't get in the other two locations. So, um, how did we go about it? Well, we did an extensive policy analysis. Uh, we conducted qualitative field work in those four provinces, um, from uh, teachers up to education officials, and also at ministry level, at the national level. And we conducted an Ipsos, a survey of Ipsos, um, of parents as well, 350 parents. Um, and we also went back and did further field work, because we had so much data that we we needed to make more sense of, that we had to keep going back. And also we kept consulting with experts in Vietnam as well, um, not just at the Institute of Educational Sciences, who were our partners, but other experts to try and help us make sure we were making sense of the system correctly. And we also looked at the very end at uh, PISA data, so particularly the survey results from PISA from school principals. We didn't do this first because we didn't want it to necessarily guide the direction of our study. We more did it to verify some of our results and see if they didn't match what was coming out in PISA. Okay, so now on to the, the key findings. So we had five promising practices that came out of our study. Um, and quite, quite broad, um, but I'll kind of whiz through them today. So the first one is purposeful policymaking at a national level. Then we have very high levels of accountability in Vietnam. Uh, the quality of teaching, uh, school leadership that's very much focused on what's going on in the classroom and not necessarily administrative and other duties, and strong partnership with parents. So I'm going to briefly go through these now. So firstly, I think what's kind of unique for um, a low to lower middle income context is that Vietnam have simultaneously focused on both access and quality and uh, they've been doing this for between 20 to 30 years and they did both at the same time um, and usually you find countries just tackle access first they try and get kids into school and then they think oh let's try and improve the system then uh, Vietnam didn't do that they tried to do both at once um, and to a certain extent you can say it's been quite successful uh, particularly as as enrollment increased as we'll see here uh, student outcomes and performance levels, they didn't decline. And that's what you'd normally expect of more students in a classroom, probably as well, more disadvantaged students, you might expect learning outcomes to reduce, but we didn't, we didn't see that in Vietnam. As you can see, they made huge gains in upper secondary, but it's kind of stagnated a little bit over the past sort of five years or so. Um, so as I was saying before about promising practice, that's still an area that Vietnam need to improve on is access for 15 year olds to basic education. Um, I think as well what we found was 
policies are incredibly consistent and persistent as well. So they don't scrap what they've previously done, come up with a new policy, think, no, that doesn't work, we'll do another one. They keep learning and building on previous policies. Um, if any policies are found to work, they'll implement again and they'll, they'll extend them. If they don't find they've worked, then uh, they might consider changing it slightly. Uh, we initially called our project education reform in Vietnam, but we were told reform is too strong a word to use in a Vietnamese context. They say, no, we don't reform, it sounds too big. You know, we kind of we go back, see what's working, and we adapt it, and we're reflective. Um, they've focused on access and quality of education for preschoolers. So all, student, all children have access to a year's preschool and that's part of the basic education system. Um, for the past 20 years or so, they've been trying to encourage more student-centred practices with teachers in the schools, and they've improved basic minimum requirements for teachers to become qualified as teachers too. And they've consistently been looking at uh, like a really strong focus, particularly on ethnic minority groups and other disadvantaged groups, and policies that can help improve um, outcomes among these groups because they're typically poorer than the kin majority. So if you take one example, so this, um, this is an aspect of a policy from 2010 that looked at improving access. And one of the ways they improve access has been by creating more schools. Um, but because it can be tricky to get head teachers uh, or school principals for, for lots of small schools, they have what's called satellite schools, and that's where multiple classrooms that are dotted around an area geographically will have will come under one administrative unit. So um, that overcomes issues that often countries face with small schools. And they have rice allowances. They've also got boarding schools for ethnic minority students, so they don't have to travel far to get to school. Um, and in the same policy, we also see a commitment to improving quality. And this is typical of every policy we looked at in Vietnam. There was a, a two-track focus. So they produced lots of teaching materials for students who speak languages other than the Vietnamese to help the teachers um, adapt the current curriculum for those students. Uh, they provide incentives for teachers to go work, high-quality teachers to go work in particularly rural areas and disadvantaged areas. And they've got new practices and things for, for the use of technology. So that's just one example of many. Um, so it's not just enough to create good policy, you also have to be able to effectively implement that policy. And in Vietnam they do so through what, what we think is a highly effective middle tier. Um, and this is made up of district and provincial level officials, but also the, the school principals, the head teachers, are also part of this middle tier too. Um, and what this does is it provides a good feedback loop and it also means there's consistency in how policy is implemented um, and it means there's consistency then in the feedback as well. So uh, school uh, district officials and provincial officials will be responsible for um, having meetings with school principals uh, at least on a monthly basis. This will be to ensure they are implementing policies correctly, but it'll also be to check whether anything isn't going to plan. And if it's not, they'll feed this back up the system. And a lot of our school principals, regardless of what province they are in, thought of this as being a logical system. And what, the more you look at Vietnam, the more you think, yes, it is a logical system. I can see why everyone describes it this way, because it all just makes sense the way things are done. And the pivotal person in this is the school principal, because they are the, the point between what's working in the school and feeding back to policymakers whether or not policies are doing as they're intended to, and if not, why not? Um, so one of the things, I guess, uh, as a researcher, you kind of self-reflective before you go into a context, and you think, what might be my preconceptions or stereotypes? And, and one of mine might have been that there were the because it's a one-party state, I thought perhaps there's some censorship over lively discussion or things you can't discuss. Um, that certainly was not the case of education. There was lively debate about everything, both good and bad. Um, and all of our interviews can kind of be characterised by a lively debate. And a lot of engagement with policy and where policy was effective or ineffective. So this is just one example of three teachers in a focus group. Um, 
So there have been policies over the past 10 years that have tried to move away from grading and high stakes assessments and more towards qualitative assessments. So giving students written feedback or verbal feedback and trying to move away from an examination system. Um, and teachers here were kind of discussing the merits and the pitfalls of such a system, um, saying that, well, parents like grades because they can see how their students are doing, but they can see the benefits of qualitative feedback for students because it gives them more of an idea of how to improve. Um, and this is kind of characteristic of all of our, all of our field work. Okay, so the next uh, key topic is that schools are highly accountable um, and there's a lot of both internal and external scrutiny. So this slide shows uh, the accountability system in a school. There are lots of actors who are all responsible for reviewing other people's performance as well as being reviewed themselves. So just within a school level, um, you've got the School People's Inspection Committee, which is a kind of political committee, and then right the way down to parents who also play a role in this accountability system. And then externally, you've got peer review from other schools, so schools will review each other in groups of three. Um, and then you've also got other external from the ministry and the district level. Uh, and this looks like a kind of scary accountability system because everyone's watching everybody, um, but it's actually built into this system there is a lot of support as well so it's not just a case of everyone feels like oh I've got people watching what I'm doing all the time and scrutinizing me um, it's all about self-improvement and feedback to help teachers and school principals and everybody improve so if you see here this is data we took from PISA and um, so PISA this is PISA 2015 oh, sorry 2012 this one and uh, so this is percentage of principals who reported um, observing their teaching staff and as you can see 99% of principals in Vietnam observe their teaching staff but you can also see that formal teacher mentoring is also in place in 99% of schools um, so there isn't this highly accountable really big inspection system without there being a support network they have both and they work quite well together um, the school principal plays a really big role in the classroom. Um, so they are very much responsible for monitoring what teachers are doing and they spend a lot of their day monitoring what teachers are doing and giving them feedback. Um, and there are also subject groups in Vietnam where there is a lot of peer support um, within their particular subject area. I'm going to kind of whiz through now because I'm going on too long. The, okay, so as I mentioned earlier, they've also increased and improved um, pre-service qualifications for teachers. So even at pre-primary level, um, teachers will have needed to have done two years uh, training in order to be a pre-primary teacher. And then the, the, le the minimum level goes up as you go throughout school. Um, and again, I'll kind of skip over this one, but I'm nearly out of time, but the, there was a big debate over... Um, there's been a lot of pressure, I think, from external donors uh, to adopt student-centred teaching methods and instead of using kind of whole class approaches. Um, and Vietnam have kind of come up with their own, they kind of negotiated this a little and said, well, sometimes you need to do whole class approaches. You can't do group work all the time. So we're going to kind of come up with our own mixed method that's very Vietnamese. Um, and that's what a lot of our teachers spoke about, and that's what they seem to have done. Um, so these are just some quotes to support that. And this is uh, kind of a remarkable figure. So another one from PISA. Only 5% of students in Vietnam said that their science teacher never gives them feedback. This is compared to 28% in OECD countries. And the reason this is impressive is because they have one of the highest class sizes out of all participating countries. So given that they had the best result in terms of uh, levels of teacher feedback, but they have an average of 40 students in their class, as opposed to the OECD average of about 25, um, that makes it a lot more impressive. Okay, so <coughs> school leaders, so they're very different to Western models. Um, they, school leaders don't have responsibility for recruitment of teachers. Um, they don't really have much control over finances, that kind of thing. But they do spend a lot of time in the classroom uh, checking teaching quality.
And as you can see here, so we asked um, some school principals to give us an account of their typical day. And this was a typical day for teachers, regardless of what province we were asking. So either Hazang, which was the really rural province, or Hanoi. Um, at least three times a day, they are spending time in the classroom um, for about three hours checking teaching quality and observing lessons. And teachers and um, school principals in Vietnam also have to teach for at least two hours a week as well. Uh, so they have to still be an active teacher. And the idea is, how can I tell you what to do if I don't practice this myself? Um, and teachers felt that way too. OK, finally, I think I'm going to finish on time. Uh, parents are a really big part of the Vietnamese school system. Um, and I think what's kind of impressive in Vietnam is they have rights and responsibilities. So it goes in both directions. And they are very much a part of the accountability system. And because of that, they're kind of, whereas in, in schools and other places around the world, in the UK, you might see parents as being kind of external to the system. In Vietnam, they feel very much part of like the internal workings of the school system. Um, so no parents in our survey out of 350 said they never feel listened to. Um, and also a lot of these parents, so 80%, do give financial contributions or in-kind contributions to schools, which is very common in Vietnam. Um, and I won't get into it, but it's a policy called socialization, which is very interesting if anyone has time to read about it. Um, so in terms of, this is again from PISA, in terms of uh, levels of parental engagement, you can see that in terms of dis parents who would discuss a child's, their child's progress on their own initiative, nearly half Parents in Vietnam do so, according to school principals, opposed to 27% in OECD countries, and 41% of parents in Vietnam will assist teachers in school, compared to only 5% on average in OECD countries, and they consistently score the highest in this ranking. Um, and I think part of this is because within policy, uh, parents have both rights and they have responsibilities too. So in terms of the rights of the parents, they have the right to be involved in school's activities. They have the right to know um, what their students, are, what their children are learning in school, how they're learning, how they're doing, and to have meetings with teachers. Um, and they have a right to play an active role in school governance, as such as being on a, a parent committee. Um, and parent committees in Vietnam, they're, they're quite complex. So you have a committee per class, so say um, grade two children will have a parent committee, and then you have a parent board for the whole school, which has uh, nominated individuals from the class committees. So as I said, it's, they're, they're very much part of the school system in Vietnam. However, they also have uh, responsibilities. So this idea that they are also responsible for that if their children are persistently not learning in school, they are part responsible. It's not just the school and it's not just the teacher. Um, and this is written into policy as well. OK, got there. So um, in terms of linking this with kind of emerging global themes, um, I think one obvious standout point is, is that Vietnam are kind of unique in how they create and implement policy in that it's very consistent, they don't chop and change all the time, they don't override previous policies and make completely new ones. Um, and they're also they're quite self-reflective in how they make policy and they're very keen to always contextualise policies. So to learn from elsewhere, but to really make them Vietnamese. Um, so there's also this balance between accountability and support. So that accountability chart I showed earlier looked kind of scary because it had you know, so many layers to it. But at the same time, because there's a support system built into that, that's what seems to make it work. Uh, in terms of teachers using a variety of pedagogical techniques, there can be a kind of tendency among certain donor organisations to kind of force teachers into particular directions with the pedagogical approaches they use. Vietnam, Vietnamese teachers have responded to this by contextualising those approaches. Um, and again, I think just the message of contextualising things is particularly important. Uh, the, the amount of time school leaders spend in classrooms is, again, I think quite unique to Vietnam and seems to be particularly important. 
and part of this is that they, they don't have the same roles that we consider uh, Western, Western school leaders to have. Um, and it is not a very decentralised system, it's incredibly centralised. So that's maybe food for thought. And parental partnership, I think, is a, is a big standout one. And it was something that you know, definitely deserved its own chapter in our report. So that's, they are our key findings. Uh, these are free on our website. So we have a summary report, if anyone doesn't fancy 150 pages. Um, but we also have the big one as well. So thank you. Thank you, Rachel. I, I, I suggest we take a quick presentation and then we have a Q&A. We have about 30 minutes to ask questions. So write your questions down and to end with us. So we have the next presenters coming in. Okay. Thank you. I think Rachel's introduced a, a lot about Vietnam, and I'm going to speak a bit more from the perspective of the Young Lives Project. Much of this detail about Vietnam wasn't known until fairly recently. It was about 10 years ago that there were any kinds of uh, data available from Vietnam that showed such high levels of attainment among pupils in primary school, initially investigated by the World Bank and then uh, by Young Lives and then more recently by PISA in 2012 and 2015. Vietnam, as Rachel has shown, stands out in an awful large, an awfully large number of ways with respect to educational indicators, particularly test scores. So Young Lives is a project which has been measuring educational attainment in four countries, and not just that, it's a study of childhood poverty and development which has started in the year 2000 and has been running in four countries, Ethiopia, Vietnam, Peru and in India. So we've been focusing particularly on Vietnam in relation to education because that was the country in which the first of the longitudinal school surveys was conducted. Uh, and in this presentation I'm going to talk about how we are investigating the question of ethnic minority performance in Vietnam compared to a majority. Rachel already pointed out that the ethnic minority groups in Vietnam are the most disadvantaged groups in educational terms and also in economic terms, but the Vietnamese government has been doing an awful lot in recent years to try to narrow that gap. So, as I said, Young Lives is a longitudinal study. It's been going on for 15 years, collecting data since the birth of 12,000 children in the, approximately the year 2001 or 2002. It's followed those children through their households and through their schools over that period of 15 years, collecting an enormous amount of data, most of which is now publicly available. So for those of you that are interested in potentially using data, secondary data, or conducting secondary analysis, a lot of that data can be downloaded free of charge. So there are two cohorts, one of 2,000 uh, younger children in each of the country, and 1,000 younger, uh, sorry, 2,000 younger children and 1,000 older children in each of the countries, which totals to, uh, 12,000. So in Vietnam, there is the household survey and the school survey. The school survey was first conducted when the children were aged 11 in grade 5, and then it was conducted again in grade 10 when they're approximately uh, 15 or 16 years old. So that survey, as you can see, is conducted in 52 schools, 14 sites across Vietnam, uh, and the pupils are all in grade 10, totaling 8,860 pupils. The design, which is followed in all the countries, not just in Vietnam, is a school effectiveness design which allows the measurement of change in pupils' performance in tests. So that means that there is an examination con conducted at the beginning of the school year and then again at the end, so that the, the study can measure change and then attribute the difference between test scores to factors that are at the school or at the household. Because one difficulty in a cross-sectional survey is, of course, that children from more advantaged backgrounds will always perform better on tests on average. And so to isolate the effects of schools or teachers, you really need to have a repeated measures design, which is what Young Lives has. So the idea is that once we have isolated those effects, we can then identify which parts of the teaching and learning process have contributed to changes in test scores. And we're calling that value added. So ethnic minorities, uh, as I said, disadvantaged in educational terms and also in economic terms, not spread evenly around Vietnam, tending to live in 
remote mountainous areas, as Rachel already showed uh, the pictures of the, the hair drying textbooks and so on. You don't get that necessarily in the more advantaged parts of Vietnam. Lots of other issues to face for ethnic minority schools. However, the basic issues have been resolved. There is almost universal access at primary level uh, and at lower secondary level, and it really comes at the upper secondary level when education is no longer compulsory that uh, ethnic minorities tend to be most disadvantaged. So there is a form of rationing. Once children pass the end of grade uh, nine, they are rationed into upper secondary schools by uh, methods of examination and also payment of fees. So naturally, ethnic minorities would be disadvantaged in both ways by being economically poorer and also less likely to achieve high test scores because <coughs> of their household background characteristics and possibly access to poorer quality schools in the past. So what's needed in order to overcome this that the government has recognized and, and partially implemented policies to address are policies which positively discriminate in order to allow access for minority groups by allowing them to access with lower levels of attainment at the, at the examination stage or by reducing or uh, eliminating fees. <coughs> so ethnic minorities in the Young Lives Survey, as you can see, are not concentrated uh, equally across all of the sites. They tend to live in Lao Cai, which is the most northerly province. There are some ethnic minority groups in the south, in Fu Yen province, but much smaller in number. So we're focusing here on Lao Cai province, which has uh, more than 50% ethnic minorities from the Hmong, Dao, Xi, Thai, and Nong ethnic groups. Lao Cai is, is a remote and rural province where 65% of the population are ethnic minorities, and it is one of the six poorest provinces in Vietnam. The two questions that we're addressing here, first of all, do ethnic minority students attend less effective schools than ethnic majority students? So, first of all, we know that ethnic minorities are disadvantaged by their economic backgrounds and their locations, <coughs> but then do they suffer a double disadvantage by then attending schools which are actually poorer quality? And secondly, if there are schools which are high quality, which are achieving effective outcomes, accessed by ethnic minorities, what are those schools doing differently? So the approach is to identify, first of all, whether there are disadvantages at school level affecting ethnic minorities, and second of all, to look for positive deviance cases, i.e., are there some schools which are overcoming those difficulties? So when we use the Young Lives data to ask that first question, do disadvantaged ethnic minorities children attend poorer quality schools? Yes, they do, on average. Now, here we're treating a qu the quality of a school as being given by its effectiveness in raising children's learning outcomes. Now, we can't attribute necessarily all of that to the school. Some of it may be that uh, the circumstances the school is operating in. But what we could see was that majority kin pupils made greater gains, and they were in the schools that made greater gains in terms of learning outcomes than ethnic minority pupils. And that effect was still there when we controlled for the differences between ethnic majority and minority pupils' backgrounds. So here the blue bar represents the unconditional effect of a school, and the red bar represents the conditional effect, where the conditional effect is taking out some of the differences that are due to home backgrounds. So even then, we see that the gap is only slightly reduced. So ethnic minorities are attending less effective schools. In the Lao Cai sample, so up in the north of Vietnam, there are 65% ethnic minorities, but there are also, of course, 35% kin. We see there that the gap is perhaps smaller, but the ethnic minority pupils are still in schools which are performing less well than majority pupils, even in the same province. Now, again, that's not surprising in a way because ethnic majority pupils tend to live in the urban areas and that tends to be where the more effective schools are, whereas ethnic minority pupils tend to live in the more remote areas where the less effective schools are. Now that pattern I think you could find in almost any country in the world, so it's, it's not at all unusual. But perhaps what is unusual is that there are some exceptions to that in Vietnam. So even in the most remote parts of Vietnam there are some schools which are performing well, this chart here shows the value-added rank of each of the schools that were included in the survey, ordered from the least value-added to the highest value-added. 
So the most effective to the least effective score. And, you know, on average, we've set the value added to be zero. So zero is, by definition, the mean value added. Any score which is above zero is adding more than, more than average value to pupils' learning, and any score which is below that mean level is adding less. So across the provinces of Vietnam, and we've coloured them here in five colours, representing the, four, the five provinces. Purple is Lao Cai, the most northerly ethnic minority province. We can see there that the purple dots, the purple schools, those in, in Lao Cai, are in general way below that mean line. So they are less effective on average than other schools. However, there is one that you can see in the top right-hand corner there, one school in Lao Cai province which is more effective not only more effective than average, but it is among the very most effective schools in all the sample in Vietnam. Now that's quite startling given that it's not only in Lao Cai, it's not in an urban part of Lao Cai, it is in a very remote rural district, a mountainous area, which looks something like the picture that Rachel showed. So that school, we thought, okay, given that we've investigated value added in Vietnam, we've got 52 schools, we've looked in a kind of um, technical, scientific way at the effectiveness of each of these schools. Now let's go to the school which is the most effective and one of the most disadvantaged in the sample. And Padmin is going to explain what we found there. Thanks very much, Kane. Um, so before I talk about this particular school in more detail, um, as you can see on the slide here, it was an ethnic minority boarding school, which um, Rachel also alluded, alluded to earlier. So let me give you a, a brief background on that policy in Vietnam. Um, it was introduced in the 1970s to increase ethnic minority participation in upper secondary education. Um, and originally it was intended to provide high quality education to gifted ethnic minority students, which in turn would produce a cadre of government officials who would work in ethnic minority areas. Today in Lao Cai, uh, there's one upper secondary ethnic minority boarding school in each district, um, and they all share these criteria. So um, there are quite tough academic criteria that you have to meet to be selected into these schools. Um, the schools provide residential facilities during term time. Um, the students don't have to pay any tuition fees and students also receive a monthly food stipend. So the school that we went to um, was called Dong Jiang Boarding School. As Kane mentioned, um, it's in a very disadvantaged area. In fact, the district that it's in was, is considered, uh, it's classed as one of the 52 most disadvantaged districts in, in the whole country. It's a mountainous maize growing area um, and looking at the school survey data from Young Lives, we can see that the students attending the school were obviously ethnic minorities, but also typically um, pretty disadvantaged. So in terms of levels of parental education, um, most students had mothers who had never been to school. Um, a few mothers had uh, some primary education. Looking at father's education, there are more who've been to primary school with some lower secondary, but again, around a quarter who've, who've never attended any school. Um, and that kind of parental educational profile was um, replicated in our qualitative study participants. Their parents typically had not been to school or had some primary education. Additionally, the students who we interviewed um, at this school as part of the qualitative study, um, they told us their parents typically worked as farmers, although um, a few students mentioned that their fathers had government jobs like a commune official or a police officer. So... One of the first things that we were interested in when we were talking to these students were what were the key enabling factors that helped them to get to this school in the first place, given that ethnic minority students normally don't get this far in, in Vietnam, or many don't. Um, and I'll just talk about this briefly. I mean, the thing, there are things really you'd expect. Firstly, there were high levels of individual ability and effort that were clear. Um, a lot of support from key individuals in their life, so families who valued education highly, teachers in primary schools who had identified them as, as very able kids. But perhaps the most important thing was that there were these positive discrimination initiatives in place um, which allowed students to progress through their primary schooling um, and, and make it to grade 10 in spite of their home disadvantage. And it seems that without that third piece of the puzzle, it would have been very difficult even for very able kids um, to have made it this far. So then once they got to the school, what are the key features that mean that it's, um, 
providing this high quality education to disadvantaged students, you know, what makes it go so high up on that graph that Kane showed you. So in terms of access for dis disadvantaged students, um, the fact that students don't pay tuition fees and the fact that it's residential, both are very important. Evidently for students from poor families, that tuition fees would be a big barrier, so the fact that they aren't there um, means that they can access the school. The fact that it's residential also meets um, some of the specific challenges that ethnic minorities face in this area that Rachel also mentioned. Um, the ethnic minority groups tend to live quite high up in the mountains. Upper secondary schools are typically located in district centres, so there's quite a long distance um, to travel. One of the students who we talked to um, talked about this advantage. She said um, when students come to this school, they have more time for learning. Uh, they don't have to miss a class due to housework or travel long distances every day. So that's both about the physical distance, but also because of the poverty of the families. When, as ethnic minority children get older, they're expected to stay at home, help at, the, at home, help on the farm. So by living at the school, they get to spend much more time on their studies. The school also, um, there was a really kind of academically supportive environment that had been created. There are quite a few different examples of this, but one... Um, is the way that the, the environment outside the classroom was set up. So every evening the students had self-study periods um, and one of the students told us how these worked. So she said, during the self-study time, um, when I have difficulties with my homework, I can ask the class monitoring board for help. If they cannot help, I ask other students in the class 10A for help or I telephone the class teacher for their advice. And the way she described it, this is quite a kind of formal... Um, hierarchy almost. The idea first in self-study is that you try and figure out your homework on your own. If you can't do that, there's like a designated <laughs> network of peers who are meant to you know, be able to help you out. And after that, if you still can't figure it out, you can, you can call the teacher. Um, and again, I think this is a way that the school had really built in beyond the classroom, this academic network of support. Um, and it also links um, nicely to another point about the way that the school emphasised the development of soft skills. So in that example, um, in the self-study period every day, students are being encouraged to develop independent learning skills, to develop teamwork and cooperation skills through peer learning. Um, and also in the classroom, the teachers talked about um, trying to encourage communication skills by getting students to give presentations regularly. Um, there was also a competency-based curriculum that was being piloted at the school, which encouraged the development of skills like problem solving. And one of the teachers told us why he thought this was so important, particularly for ethnic minority students. Um, so he said, I think the life skills that students develop here will be very useful when they enter the wider society. Our ethnic minority students, when they graduate from this school and enter a higher education institution, they're very confident. They can quickly get used to the new environment. So at least according to this teacher, the development of soft skills was not only important to help the ethnic minority students' academic progression, but also somehow equipped them with skills that would help them maybe overcome some of the social, social disadvantage that they would typically face um, in, in wider society. So overall then, just to recap, um, it seems that this ethnic minority boarding school managed to overcome equity and quality related challenges which typically limit ethnic minority access and attainment at upper secondary level through these key features. So the fact that there are no tuition fees uh, it's, and the residential model the high levels of academic support and this emphasis on soft skills. But it is also important to note that the school is exclusively for the most academically able ethnic minority students. So any quality education or school effectiveness that we have observed is a reflection of what the school is doing and what the teachers are doing, but also of the students who have been selected into that school. So that's an important thing to remember, I think. Just to finish then, what are some of the wider implications of, of our findings? So the findings that came presented from our, our quantitative data show that the post-basic education system in Vietnam still does reproduce um, wider socioeconomic inequalities between ethnic minority and majority students. Um, ethnic minority students across the country are more likely to be enrolled in less effective schools. And if we define an equitable system as one in which access to quality education is based on students' academic performance and effort rather than their socioeconomic status, we can see that Vietnam is not quite there yet, particularly at the post-basic level.
Um, but the ethnic minority boarding school policy that we've looked at does reflect a corrective approach to achieving an equitable system. It's a clear example of positive discrimination in which the government is investing a high level of resources to try and ensure that gifted ethnic minority students can access quality education in spite of their socioeconomic disadvantage. So what could this model suggest um, beyond the Vietnamese context? Well, as we've discussed, the residential model um, of the school addresses very specific challenges that ethnic minority students face. Um, it could be relevant for disadvantaged groups in, in other contexts. For example, in Uganda, um, there are boarding schools set up at secondary level to encourage girls to enrol. Um, it, tribal social welfare schools in India operate on a similar principle, but obviously that's not going to kind of address the challenges facing all disadvantaged groups um, in all contexts. Maybe the most transferable lessons that we can take from our case study and also drawing very much on the work that the Education Development Trust has done is broadly this kind of logical approach that the Vietnamese education system takes to tackling its problems um, and plus this commitment to positive discrimination. In this case that we've looked at, um, this has involved the government um, identifying key challenges facing disadvantaged students, implementing interventions to address these challenges and finally, perhaps most importantly, having the political and economic motivations to develop equity-focused interventions to compensate for disadvantage in the education system. Thanks very much. Well, now we're going to look at uh, teacher value added in Ethiopia. Uh, this is also actually based on the Young Lives data uh, that Ken uh, already introduced earlier. And uh, the idea of teacher value added is just to see, you know, um, what is the effectiveness of a teacher uh, for a group of kids in a classroom within a given year. So that is what we are going to look at here. It's still preliminary, so much of this hasn't been fully analyzed, but uh, it's, giving, uh, it's giving us some insights on things that we can look at later on. This paper is uh, myself, Ken, uh, and Jack, who is actually in the audience there. Jack works uh, at Center for Global Development, but was involved uh, in the Young Lives uh, data. And Ken might come to present some of the, the later sections of the paper. So. Um, for those who might not know what we call teacher value added, uh, there is, uh, it relates a bit to what Ken talked about in relation to uh, school value added. But the idea is that uh, if you have a group of kids in a classroom uh, who are taught by one teacher at the beginning of the year, and you are able to test them at the beginning of the year, and then uh, they stay with this one individual teacher until the end of the year, and you test them again, the difference between uh, their performance in the prior test and the latter test uh, is supposed to give us a sense of the value that that teacher has added to this uh, heterogeneous group of students in the classroom, and we call that teacher value added. Um, it's been used quite a lot in the U.S. Uh, in some ways in terms of holding teachers accountable for teacher incentives, for, for all manner of things. It's quite controversial. Uh, economists have taken it to, sh to say that actually teacher value added can improve lives, uh, dramatically improve economic growth, because it can generate all this amount of learning uh, within a given year. But uh, we think that uh, in the context of Ethiopia, we don't want to use it that way. We think it's a very relevant uh, analytic approach, and we could use it in different ways uh, to understand a number of things. And that is what we try to do in this paper. How could we use teacher value added uh, as an analytic tool uh, for us to relate it to school curriculum, uh, to relate it to pedagogy, and uh, also to relate it to teaching at the right level? and uh, related to learner school readiness and teacher adaptability. Because we think that all these things uh, have a combination of teacher uh, content, uh, uh, subject content knowledge, plus also teacher pedagogic knowledge. And if the teacher value added can help us to understand this, this might be better than using it to uh, um, enforce teacher accountability. Uh, for this particular study, we've got uh, uh, data, it's Young Lives data, as I've said, and we've got data um, for uh, mathematics um, assessment, particularly, for about 9,434 uh, students in 271 classrooms across the 63 schools. So the data is rich enough for us to be able to undertake uh, this kind of analysis. And 
I mean, the presumption uh, within any typical context is that teachers are expected to deliver a, a grade-specific curriculum, and that grade-specific curriculum uh, uh, is set out in textbooks and teachers, teacher guides. And then every, every, every curriculum design is such that it's cumulative. So when you move from grade one um, to go to grade two, what you learn in grade two it builds up on what you learned in grade one. So that is how most school systems tend to function. Uh, but we know that uh, it's not always uh, that, uh, that way because uh, teachers face uh, possibly uh, a heterogeneous classroom. So they're not homogeneous classroom. You've, you've got every teacher facing a classroom with a group of kids who are, you know, early achievers. So they come into grade, grade, grade one when they're school ready. And so when the teacher starts teaching, they, they get these things. And some come to school when they're not school ready. And so it's, it's difficult. So a teacher has to adapt in order to be able to uh, make up for that lack of school readiness. So that is why the teacher adaptability is a, a factor we look at there. But the other thing is that uh, 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 the teacher adaptability is also varies. I mean, some teachers are able to adapt to that heterogeneous classroom scenario, while other teachers are not able to adapt to that heterogeneous classroom scenario. And we want to find out uh, through this, you know, what, what, is, what is the mechanism of that in the Ethiopian context. But the other challenge is also the, the level of curriculum, which is teaching at the right level. So in most instances, the curriculum is already set uh, in a certain way. So whether the kid is coming into the, into the class um, uh, at lower prior learning, learning level, the curriculum is already set for grade two. So the curriculum doesn't take note of the fact that by the time you're coming to grade two, you're actually not prepared to grade two stuff. You're supposed to do grade two stuff whether you are prepared for it or not. So the curriculum is already centered. And the teacher then has to teach this centered curriculum. So you can imagine if the teacher is, has to teach this centered curriculum and the teacher is not able to adapt uh, that curriculum to a kid who is coming into grade two with low prior understanding of what is supposed to be taught at that level, then there's a huge pedagogical challenge in that classroom. And these are the things we are trying to disentangle uh, in the context uh, of Ethiopia. And uh, this is an example of what we call uh, uh, you know, a tightly, a tightly uh, heterogeneous sort of class. So you've got uh, uh, in the far, in the in the in the in the, in the on the left side is a low performing teacher. So that teacher there is facing this class distribution, which is tight. But you see, the teacher can't do much. So basically, the teacher can't adapt to the class. So the learning gain uh, is very little. So this this these kids can never really uh, achieve much with that kind of teacher. So the teacher is the red bar. So that is a low a low performing teacher. This is just a hypothetical scenario uh, whereby a teacher is facing uh, um, 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 uh, a classroom, uh, but the teacher is not able to actually uh, center their teaching in a manner that can uh, be considerate of that, that classroom. And the second one is a high performing teacher. So this teacher is able to actually adapt into the classroom and be able to produce these high learning gains. And so the, the teaching is centered for all the kids so the teaching is able to cover uh, 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 that tight distribution of kids and the learning gains uh, are greater for that particular class. So that's, again, hypothetical scenario. And uh, what about the curriculum? So here you can find a teacher who actually has to deal with that uh, heterogeneous classroom, but also has to deal with uh, curriculum, which is already centered. So you can't do anything. This is what you're supposed to learn in grade, grade two. So the teacher has to deal with both uh, this heterogeneous classroom where the kids' abilities are, you know, differently distributed, but also has to deal with a centered curriculum, what has to be taught at grade two, irrespective of whether when you came to grade two you are ready for grade two material or not. And you can see that there that actually what happens is that most teachers end up not being able to do that because most kids are left out. So uh, a low-performing teacher will actually not do very well for this group of kids, and even a high-performing teacher, the green one, will also not do well for this group of kids because they are facing the two barriers. They are facing uh, the centered curriculum, but they are also facing uh, this uh, heterogeneous classroom. So the kids who end up benefiting are just this group of kids. So the all of that group is left out in terms of a classroom instruction by a teacher. Again, hypothetical scenario, but this is you know building up uh, on the kind of challenge that teachers face in a classroom in a typical context. Curriculum centering and heterogeneous classrooms. Now, uh, this is real data now from Ethiopia. So in this real data, uh, this data here, uh, Jack could speak a lot more on it better than me, but it just shows the distribution and we can see some schools actually did 
better in terms of uh, uh, the average, uh, which is centered at zero, and some schools didn't do much. But generally, it shows us few group schools that are doing well and a number of schools that are not. But I mean, most of them are just, you know, within the average. So it's just giving you what we saw, what we saw in the data in terms of the distribution of performance. But we decided to pick two schools to illustrate those two the things that I was showing. So if you look at these two schools, uh, the school on the left-hand side is a school where uh, that line shows uh, the, test at, uh, the test at the beginning, and the red one, the dotted red one, is the, test, uh, the second test. And you can see um, within that, uh, that uh, in, the first, in the first graph on the left-hand side, the graph which is this way, um, uh, the performance there is steeper, which means that uh, uh, generally what the storyline there is in short is that kids who, are, kids who are brighter did very well. Kids who are brighter did very well in that classroom, but kids who are not brighter didn't do very well. So if you're a bright and you're facing this teacher in that heterogeneous classroom, you end up performing very well if you stay with this teacher for one year. But if you're not a very bright kid, you even, you even perform, your performance get worse. Uh, you looked at the right hand side, this is a class which is a bit more homogeneous, but it does show us there that kids who are, who are less bright actually do improve in the second test by you know, being taught by this teacher. But the brighter kids don't improve as much as the kids on the, on the other graph. So sort of the kids uh, who are brighter lose out. So generally, what is actually an effective teacher? Because you know, these are the two classrooms. One is a bit more homogeneous, the other one is heterogeneous. Uh, both of them have made improvement. Which one actually can you consider to be the one that has uh, produced the greatest teacher value added? And these are the contexts that we see in Ethiopia. Now, um, the questions we are asking are, how much of the variance in teacher value added is explained by differences in the pre-achievement levels of the students? So, you know, you know is, is, the, is, the, is the class heterogeneity or the, the pre-achievement the main factor uh, that explains this, or is it teacher adaptability, or other factors? I listed those at the beginning. Uh, are some teachers more effective for certain types of students? Does the strength of the relationship uh, between prior achievement and subsequent performance vary across teachers? So are more effective teachers facing classrooms of uh, students with high prior achievement, uh, or are more effective teachers facing more ho homogeneous uh, group of students, whatever the level of their prior achievement? So these are the questions we are asking through this data. And the next step, we try to do what we call quintile analysis to say, well, let's look at uh, prior achievement and you know, you know, group them into quintiles and see uh, how, are they f how are these teachers effective given the heterogeneous group of kids they were facing in these classrooms. And Ken might want to explain that, probably. I mean, this really was just, just to illustrate whether the relationship between the prior test score and the end of the year test score is the same for pupils of different starting points. And actually, it looks like mostly it is. You know, wherever children start on the particular distribution of attainment, they tended to go up in a similar relationship by the end of the year, which at first seems surprising. But actually, if you look at the numbers, so children who got 400 in the first test tended to go on to get about 450. But those who got 600 went on to get maybe sort of 620. So students with a lower starting point, they made a greater gain in terms of absolute attainment. Maybe that's what you would expect. Maybe it's easier from a lower base to make more progress. But the reason for doing this was less, to, well, first to test this relationship, but then secondly, to try to understand whether or not teacher effectiveness also varies when they're facing children of different starting points within their classroom. Why is this important in Ethiopia? I guess, first of all, because teachers face large classrooms. Sometimes they have as many as 80 children in a primary school classroom. Second, they face a curriculum which is already prescribed, as Moses said, and they often have to choose between teaching the curriculum and teaching something that children can actually understand. If their abilities and their prior learning is way away from the curriculum, there's a big gap there for the teacher to, to worry about. And it may be that the school inspection system and the teacher training encourages teachers to actually teach to the curriculum rather than to the children that are in their class. So some teachers will be better able to adapt than others, and that may be about their own pedagogical skills. Maybe the more qualified and the more experienced teachers are better able to adapt their teaching to the children. Now, it's extremely difficult to answer such complicated questions in a quantitative way. So we've, what we've done is just attempt 
to look at whether or not school or sorry teacher level value added is the same for each teacher when they're teaching different kinds of pupils. So every class has got in it a range of ability. Of course, some are more heterogeneous than others. We split the classes into five groups based on the, the children's starting test scores. So there are five quintiles of starting test scores, each represented by a different colour. <coughs> Teacher value added is exactly the same principle that Moses just explained. But here it's now broken up into five variants of teacher value added, <coughs> and that's the value added for the least able and the most able kids and all those kids in between. So what we've then done is order all of the teachers starting with the lowest value added teacher and ending with the highest value added teacher. So this graph represents the least effective 50 teachers in the entire sample. Now one thing I should say, echoing what Moses said, was that we're not interested here in teacher accountability. So this is not a kind of high-stakes exercise saying which teachers are good and which te teachers are bad. It's a diagnostic exercise to try to understand what sort of circumstances teachers face and what they can do with different kinds of pupils to make progress. So if you look at the lowest performing teacher in value-added terms, there are three pieces of information here about the most able group, the second most able group, and the third most able group. So we suspect that teacher probably doesn't have any children in the other two groups. But this teacher is way below average on value added, negative numbers here, and is particularly ineffective for those two groups of most able pupils. The next one seems to be quite similar. The most able pupils here make very low progress when taught by that teacher. This is the grey colour Q5, the most able pupils. And that seems to be generally true for lots of the, of the least effective teachers, they were particularly ineffective for the most able pupils. Does that make sense? Yes. Good. Um, and then as you go up the rankings, right, so we come to the middle here. These are teachers in the middle. Let's come back to them and look at teachers at the top. So those are the most effective 50 teachers. Now, the most effective 50 teachers... In a way, to be the most effective teacher in all of Ethiopia, you probably had to be effective for all of the children that you taught. Otherwise, it would be difficult to get to the top of the rankings. And we see that up here, that this one has got kind of fairly even spaced bars uh, for whichever ability grouping they are fairly effective. But then as you come further down, there's different patterns. And in the middle, it's very uncertain. And it seems that being an average teacher in terms of effectiveness you could be effective for some pupils and not for others, which is kind of what you would expect to get to the middle. So if we take this one, which is kind of my favourite, because this one is very effective for the most effective, for the most able pupils and very ineffective for those in the middle, so it seems. Now, it could be that this is just a kind of glitch of the data, but it could be that there's some diagnosis in here that the teacher is teaching in a particular way or is worrying about a particular thing. So... For example, teachers with very high grey areas are only effective for the most able pupils. This teacher here, very effective for Q5, but very ineffective for everybody else. So one could suspect that they're teaching material which is too difficult. I thought someone was going to say something. So I think that's, that's it, really. It's about the diagnostic tool which you can use to dis disaggregate value added by ability of the pupils and then use it to try to understand what teachers might be doing. Great. Thank you, Ken. And um, uh, so the paper will be completed eventually based on this analysis. And at some point, probably if we have time, we will want to find out who are these teachers and what makes them effective, this group of 50 teachers. And that will be a qualitative study at, uh, of its own at some point. Quantitatively, that's all we can do, but it enables us to, us to see that there are some 50 teachers who are very effective in this Young Lives data. And to find who they are, what they do, and what makes them, makes them most effective would be interesting next step. With that, we come to the end of the presentations, and I open it up for a uh, question and answer uh, for all the three presentations today. So thank you very much. We have, we have about 15 minutes, 20 minutes for questions, and I suggest that we take a little bit of time. And, uh, uh, could you please just say your name and uh, direct your question to Dr. So, who wants to have a, have a go?
All clear? Yes, please. Uh, for the young lives group, my name's uh, Colin. I'm actually working in Ethiopia, but it's about the hit. Um, the school that you uh, talked about, the World Performing School, one of the things that you did mention, that there was very high selection criteria. Did you manage to do any analysis of that school against schools with similar selection criteria? I mean, it is value-added, isn't it? So that's the point, is that the ch children in that school are being compared to similar children. So it's we are taking account of the fact that, that the prior test score, you know, accounts for their initial ability. So it's not like comparing schools just on raw results, because sure. then, of course, you'd expect the grammar schools and so on to be at the top. Yeah. But this is how much change there was. So that, I think, accounts for a lot of that issue. Yeah, I think the selection in, into upper secondary school is interesting in Vietnam as well, because... Um, it, it's kind of set within province, so um, the, the top performing kids in, the, in a grade 10 entrance exam in, in Lao Cai province would be eligible to enter this school and a couple of other schools which are better than it in the province that weren't in our survey. Um, but then I think actually if we haven't done, I think we have done this formally, if you look at when, we, when Kane showed that graph with the kind of top 10 schools and our um, Lao Cai school was up in that top 10, it's very likely that the, the rest of the schools in their top 10 are also the most selective schools in, in the other provinces because that's, I guess, they've, they've selected the best performing kids in their provinces and so um, are up at the top there in terms of the highest value added. And we did think about that when we were writing this paper, that there's, there's another equity issue. So, that, you know, you resolve the equity issue of the poor, bright kids not getting access by providing such a special type of school, but you've still got the less bright kids from disadvantaged backgrounds. They don't have access to the same quality of school. Any other question? Comments? Doesn't have to be a question. Observation? Yes, please. Uh, I wanted to ask about the uh, ethnic minority school, which was uh, way out, and uh, uh, that purple one that was at the top of the graph. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the name of it. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, you, you ended your presentation by talking about what's most transferable, so accountability and positive discrimination being two, two standout factors. As far as that school was concerned, it seemed that um, a lot of the things that, that seemed to make it effective were both cheap and culturally quite quite neutral. So, so low fees uh, isn't a really a, a cultural thing. Don't belong to cultures where high fees are considered great. Uh, soft skills, self-study time, puzzle solving, learner training, student network. So, as far as as far as uh, uh, tangible takeaways are concerned. Uh, is there is there space for perhaps some uh, uh, policy borrowing or model borrowing from adversity? So instead of uh, all people always uh, looking for um, uh, ideas that work absolutely everywhere, looking to places like that school where where you've got adverse conditions. Is there, does that not provide a, 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 a rich context for, for, for getting really good ideas as to what works? And is anyone taking learning from those ideas and applying them elsewhere? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. I mean, uh, one thing I should say, I probably could have put up some pictures of that specific school, actually. Um, it's true that it's, it's low resource for the for the kids, obviously they don't have to pay to go to that school, but it's actually quite an expensive intervention for the government. I mean, upper secondary school fees are typically quite expensive and the government is covering those costs. It's a, it's a very it's an impressive building. They've got a lot of facilities which um, kind of are comparable to the best upper secondary schools in, in that province and um, in other provinces too. So I guess what makes it a kind of equitable intervention is that it's, uh, it's low cost for the students, but it is a, a high cost intervention for the government. Um, there are other interventions that are going on in Lao Cai that we thought maybe looked a bit more scalable um, as they are a bit less expensive. So there are semi-boarding schools at primary and lower secondary level. Um, so students can board during the week, but they go home at the weekend. So that overcomes some of the, uh, the same issues about living in remote areas and so on, but at a lower price for the government. And so they can roll that out to more children, including the, those from disadvantaged families who are maybe not as bright as the ones who end up here. But in terms of policy borrowing from Vietnam, I think that's, or from countries like Vietnam, I think it's of increasing interest. Um, I think certainly reports like the one that the Education Development Trust can really point to some of the things that they're doing in their system, which aren't all about 
high cost interventions a lot of it is just how how the system functions and a kind of ethos i guess um but yeah i definitely agree it's an important area to look at let you have just a comment to add to that uh no i th well i think in terms of it's kind of controversial <coughs> but in terms of vietnam financing these high cost interventions for ethnic minority groups uh, the policy i, I touched upon called socialization mm. um so it's seen by some as privatisation because it involves the collection of private funds from parents but what it does is it allows the government to put more money into disadvantaged groups by allowing the schools in more affluent areas to collect more resource from their local community so the government can in turn put less money into the more affluent areas and more money into the more disadvantaged areas so there are quite a few things Vietnam does on a policy level that enables them to um, input more financially into disadvantaged groups. And that is quite controversial, but it did seem to be very important um, when we were doing our study. And just on the, on the lessons thing, it occurred to me, when you look at Vietnam, it is a very logical system, and you could almost imagine someone's made a list of demand constraints and supply constraints, and they've just come up with an intervention to solve each one of them. Now, it made me think, why don't other countries do that? And I think that's the, that's the question from Vietnam to me, is that, you know, why, for example, in India, are these same constraints there, but the policies don't actually address them? They serve other interests, or there may be reasons why policies that would successfully solve those problems aren't implemented. And I might think people hide behind the one-party state a little with that, um, in terms of thinking, well, you know, it's socialist, one-party... If you don't have to um, battle with kind of elections and things like that, then you can depoliticize your education policies and base them on evidence. But anyone can do that, um, and you know that's something that comes up when I usually do my talks. People ask, "Well, that's, isn't that because Vietnam are a one-party state?" And I think, no, anyone can be evidence-informed, and and it's exactly as, as Kane just said in terms of looking at it in that very logical way. Any any state can do that. Yes. My name is <coughs> Macron and that's why. Uh, with regard to Vietnam, uh, one of the uh, things you said is at the, at the very beginning they emphasize both access and uh, quality. Uh, there is, I don't know, it's a dichotomy always there is a trade off between access and quality. For instance, in, in Ethiopia, the in, in emphasis is uh, access and uh, as a result, a uh, huge challenge in, in terms of quality of edu education. How do they manage to square these two things? Is it only a dichotomy? Is it possible to have to aim and actually implement both um, achieving access and quality education? So at the same time as they were implementing policies such as the boarding school policy, um, rice allowance, waiving tuition fees, those kinds of things that uh, promote access. They were also implementing policies that increased minimum levels of qualifications for teachers, um, providing more in-service teacher training. Um, they, and, and they come up with these policies by, so in terms of the, the teaching standards that are in Vietnam, <clears throat> which are what the accountability system is based on, uh, they actually came up with these with an Australian academic uh, who looked at systems in Canada, the UK, the US, um, and they said, what are the teaching standards in those contexts, um, and how can we contextualise them for Vietnam? And this is all done at the exact same time as they were doing all of the, the policies relating to access. Um, and I, I guess Vietnam have been benchmarking themselves against Canada, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, um, and I think that came across quite strongly, is at no point have they been benchmarking themselves against countries of equivalent economic status to themselves. It's very much, you know, we, that's, in terms of the quality of our education, we want to be the same as other high-income countries. Um, so, you know, in terms of how they've managed to do it, I think the, the logical system helps. Um, it helps that they have this middle tier to help them effectively implement policy as well. Um, and it helps, I think, they're reflective on seeing when policies are working and allowing feedback to come back up the system when things don't work so they can then adjust them um, 
and you know rethink policies based on how well they're working. And I think it's, it's because of this that it's allowed them to, to, to focus on the two things at once and not sacrifice one for the other. If, if Maybe also not trying to do too much. If, if you, mm. I don't know if you agree. So there are yeah. five subjects in the primary school curriculum in Vietnam. That's all, uh, and there is a very clear emphasis on those five subjects. Other things people may do at their own expense: music, English, and so on, and pay in the afternoon to attend mm. ex extra classes. But the core curriculum is very narrow. It's the same everywhere. Exactly the same textbook in every province. So there's a certain sort of systematized, centralized, but very reduced, minimal curriculum there which is taught very well mm -hmm. yeah. okay yes please uh, uh, when I uh, was listening the different teachers they are inefficient to different students I I report that sometimes this teachers ability sometimes this teachers teachers tries things from my own experience uh, I was the one that they given up because I'm the excellent student and the, the teachers, they thought that you were able to go to the better university so you don't need to, um, we don't need to pay more attention about you because anyway you can go to that school. But what they try to do is they analyze all the <coughs> students and they identify that the most students they need to help because the more students they, they help the more students can cross the national exam line so the graduation rate from that school will increase so yeah sometimes it's their ability sometimes they can try but i think that might be a little the bit. choice yeah their choice they choose to give up some students okay most is the excellent students and the disadvantaged students. Can I just add something quickly on that? I think that also depends on the context. So in Vietnam, teachers are incentivized for children to reach a particular standard in exactly the way you described. So children have already reached that, maybe of a lower priority than those who are behind. But in other systems that are elitist, all the attention goes to the most able pupils and actually others are left behind entirely. And I think that's a big difference between Asian contexts and others. I mean, I think in Britain and the former British colonies, often the system was elitist. It was centered on, on the most able and extending them to the maximum, whereas the Chinese and Vietnamese systems were incentivized to raise everyone to the middle. And yes, I, I, yes, yeah. the middle part. I think that's, but that's interesting in the light of those graphs. It's also interesting where private tuition comes in, I think, in Vietnam. I mean, we really <coughs> see the Vietnamese government education system is exemplary it is in the world but especially when we speak to Vietnamese colleagues there and they talk about their own children's experiences they don't think very much of the government system and, and they're enrolling their kids in private tuition because yes. the, the minimum that the schools can get them to is fine but you know middle class wealthier families don't think that's enough for their kids and so that's where they pay for extra education your know, English classes and so on which will meet the level that they're they're aspiring to for their kids yes actually they are students they have potential to go to the best one but they think well the good one is enough so we have to to care about the middle part the more numbers students could cross the line the more achieved yeah they will feel sense of achievement so well, that sounds really sensible because eventually also the the brighter kids benefit because when you pay attention to the kids who are not bright but you still expose them to the same pedagogical approach in the classroom, it, it might be that you don't necessarily um, disadvantage uh, the brighter kids. But although, I mean, the graph we showed in Ethiopia did show that uh, homogeneous classrooms, uh, the brighter kids get disadvantaged when they're taught by the teacher. Uh, but in heterogeneous classrooms, um, um, uh, the brighter kids actually do better. So it's, I think, yeah, a mix of these evidences across a different context would be very useful to look at. Yeah. Uh, are there any other questions? Yes, please. We have. It seems to me that the indicator or the criteria that you're looking at the projects in the schools, uh, it, that 
that's a good question. I mean, um, what is quality? Um, yes, to an extent, we took um, a much more pragmatic measure of quality to assume that, I mean, if you take a mathematical test, for example, within any, any mathematics assessment, there is, there is procedural flu fluency, there is uh, com comprehension. A, a good math teacher goes through about five steps, actually, in order to teach mathematics properly. I can't remember them all on top of my head now. But if you look at all those five steps of mathematical teaching, they're actually life skills, all of them. So, it, I mean, to somebody who doesn't do maths, you might say, oh, it's simply a mathematics lesson. But actually, if you look at the procedural process of mathematics teaching, it actually does include decision making. It includes uh, imagination. All these things are involved in those five steps. So I do agree to some extent on people who question what quality is. But I also normally say, no, uh, in, if you have a good test, a good cognitive test that is actually properly, properly developed, uh, it will capture these other unobservable, unmeasurable aspects of, of quality. That's my answer, but my colleagues can answer differently. I think that's an interesting answer because clearly there are things that you can't measure on, on, on these tests, but the problem is they are difficult to measure and the exercise that we're doing here requires being able to make these sorts of measurements. So we're not claiming that we've covered every dimension of quality. Um, although Padmini in, in the qualitative exercise did talk quite a bit about other things that are going on in the ethnic minority boarding school and I guess that's an important question so if you want to provide a good quality of education to achieve these learning outcomes and let's say economic job market outcomes what else do you need to do? You do need to teach soft skills, you do need to value, value students experiences, you do need to involve their parents, all of those things but of course measuring those things is really tough. If you wanted to measure parental involvement, for example, it would be very complex. We have, we have time for maybe one question, so, uh, so that we can finish <coughs> on time. It's exactly 7 o'clock. I don't want to keep people here. But let me see how many hands are up so that we can say, uh, we can take them up. Uh, one, two, three. Can you make your question as brief as possible? Then we will, we will finish on time. Yeah, so you go and then him and then him. So when you say the group of elite students being disadvantaged, does that mean their performance stays the same or it gets worse? It gets worse. Oh, the graph that shows that the kid, the, het the heterogeneous classroom, the kids who had got prior higher score, yeah. um, it simply means that they don't gain as much compared to the ones uh, who... So it's not that they get worse. No, so they didn't go down. Sometimes they, sometimes they, they can go down, I think, in the other graphs that Ken showed, but in the two graphs I showed, it didn't say that they got worse, they just didn't gain as much compared to the other group, uh, which was much more heterogeneous. Yeah. Yes? Um, I was just curious about the accountability chart that you showed earlier on, where it said teachers, there was an arrow pointing from mm -hmm. teachers to teachers, mm -hmm. um, but which is a, a very useful uh, a teacher, and I find it very useful. We get feedback from other teachers. Do you know? Uh, would it be possible to provide a little bit more information as to how that was structured? Do they have, say, a period or two a week in which teachers are actually able to sit with each other and exchange ideas? I always found it to be very productive. I, I'm curious to see how it happens over there. Uh, most of the teachers in our sample spoke of it as like a daily occurrence in terms of... Okay, so in terms of the accountability system, just very quickly, you have a self-review as a teacher, you have a peer review form as well, then you have a subject lead review form, so the subject lead will also review you. And then you have a school principal form, they'll review you, and then there's also an external form, and they'll review your teaching. Um, and all of those things are designed to give you feedback as a teacher, as, as well as checking you're meeting the standards. Um, and the teachers just speak of them as being both. So, so none of the teachers spoke negatively about these forms to us. Um, and they did speak negatively about other things, so I don't think they were just being polite. Um, and... Uh, they also said they meet, the, the amount they met kind of varied though, so I don't know in terms of meeting as a subject group, I can't say whether or not that was consistent, uh, we didn't kind of get a picture of that, but in terms of them observing one another, that did seem to be a, a daily occurrence, and none of them seemed to mind, um, it was a kind of a similar to come in our classroom, observe us, it could be the school principal, it could be the subject lead, it could be another teacher, um, but it helps me improve was the kind of general feeling.
When you describe it, the accountability sounds terrifying, doesn't it? It sounds like you're being watched from 100 directions. But I asked the question in Vietnam, you know, do, do many teachers ever get fired as a result of this process? Yeah. And the answer was no, no one ever does, really. No. So it's all supportive. It's not really kind of about yeah. getting rid of bad teachers. So I asked, I asked someone at the ministry um, whether, well, what happens if a teacher keeps underperforming? And, you know, what happens to them? And he kind of thought it was a stupid question. Um, he's just like, what do you mean, what happens to them? He said, they, they improve. Uh, so, you know, that was the kind of, <laughs> no. Um, and there, was, there, were no, there were no punishments or anything like that associated with if you got a bad feedback form, it would be, okay, we'll, we'll give you feedback, work on it, and then work on it again and again and again until, you know, you, you improve. I've got a funny answer on that one as well, where I asked the same question and, and the head teacher said, if, if it really got so bad that we couldn't do anything, we'd ask that teacher to speak to a war veteran. <laughs> <laughs> because they would need to become more patriotic. Right. Wow. But it does seem to me that teachers are normalized, uh, uh, the norms of teaching and how teachers are socialized in Vietnam uh, has carried on for a while. So they don't see this as a task that is, you know, disin disincentivizing because they have been socialized that way maybe over a long period of time so when you're a new teacher you come in you get socialized by old teachers they tell you oh this is crap don't do this we know we just hung the court and you know when you become a middle level teacher and you become a senior teacher you do the same thing but if you're socialized in that kind of way then you know it becomes a norm of teaching so the way they explain it to me it seemed to me this is yeah. a, a normalized mm. process is, in, yeah. in Vietnam mm -hmm. uh, last question please could you speak a little bit loud so we can hear you? Sorry. You talked about uh, school-based uh, feedback having it for teachers. Uh, you mentioned something about teachers are fulfilling socialization. And I wanted to find out, did you identify any feedback channels from the rural, these rural areas to, let's say, national policy level? And if there are any, or if there aren't any, would you say the Vietnamese one-party state that you described has accounted for the persistency in policy over time. So you're talking about feedback from parents or feedback from the school level? Yeah, from school level, do you identify any similar uh, feedback channels to the ministry, for example? So it, it all goes up kind of a vertical system of, and you know, parents are part of that too. So the school principal will meet with a, a district or a provincial official they'll discuss how policies have been implemented. That district official will meet with their supervisors, potentially at the ministry, and they'll feed back up to there. And we, we did ask, um, has anything you've fed back actually changed? And not all of them said yes, but some said yes. So again, it seems to be whether or not it would, f it would fit a wider agenda, whether or not they were the only school principal that said that there was, um, that there was something negative about how they implemented something. I think there are lots of factors as to whether or not it would it would impact policy. Um, and parents are part of that system too. So the school committees and the school boards, they can also feed back to principals. Um, and you know, it's not uncommon for parents to protest either if they're not happy with the policy. And there have been cases where parents have protested so much that policies have been changed. Um, either at a national level or just in their district level or their particular school even. There are some cases of schools being exempt from certain policies because parents have protested against them. Um, so that there are different levels that, that um, the system kind of responds to like a grassroots level, but it is, it is quite tightly in this very vertical structure. So you wouldn't have a school principal speaking directly to the ministry. It would go up through multiple layers. Thank you. We have to bring it to a close. Uh, uh, if you have got anything else, please follow up with the panelist. But uh, applause to the panelist. Th thank you for coming and for, you know, keep connected to SIN. We always have this seminar series. And as you can see, there are good ideas to share. And thank you for your good questions. Yeah. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, thank you. For nice coming. to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you as well. Thank, thanks, Ken. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Mike.